are the Y'all Show. Talk with a Southern accent. I'm John Rawl. Good to have you aboard the program that covers everything in the South. And of course, we've been focused, as the whole world has been, on COVID-19 over the last few days. And to help us understand what in the world is going on, we're going to bring in an expert on the subject, a microbiologist and a New York native. And he's going to be joining us right now. Dr. Dean Hart is our guest here on the Y'all Show. Welcome into the show, sir. Oh, hello, y'all. <laughs> well, we're we're good. We're worried about y'all. Where are you located? We're down south. We're down south all over. We cover 16 southern states. But you are in New York, of course. Y'all are getting pummeled right now with COVID-19. Yeah, as I look at the map, the south is not immune. It, it would seem it's good to be in the west. Yes. Like Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not in Idaho, unfortunately. <laughs> well, or fortunately, however you want to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're the epicenter right here. They've developed tents where you can walk over and, and get tested if they give you an appointment. The problem is that appointments are not abundant for this. So, so, so um if you have a fever, it takes a day to get the test, then a day to get the results. But the testing is really picking up. Okay. Now, you studying microbiology like you do, does it surprise you that we've seen this COVID-19 outbreak here this year? And could it be even worse than what we're experiencing? Well, we've seen through history all sorts of plagues and epidemics it's not unusual to think we have an epidemic um or a pandemic with all the flights and airplanes going all over the world all the time and uh, not only do people travel you know the speed of sound almost but uh, the packages do too so we have a very internet connected situation here uh, what surprises me is how well china is actually doing China's actually doing much better than I would have expected or we're not getting good reports from them because the incidence keeps going up and up in New York and we keep testing and finding more. That doesn't surprise me. The China's arrested the dilemma. That, that surprises me. Do you trust China? No. Okay. But, <laughs> but, but you're saying the numbers are good. Now, South Korea is a... It looks like they've done the best job of any country with this thing. Well, can understand that there was the SARS, which is similar to this, is very similar, different strain we have of the SARS, and South Korea was all geared up to deal with the SARS. So they're prepared, and they didn't unprepare. I guess in 2015 or so, they got ready to go in South Korea, and then they never stopped being prepared because they figured it was not a question of if, but when another epidemic would occur. So she, they were prepared then and just kept it going and probably improved upon the pandemic response for their country. They're still not where we've got to get, but they're way ahead of us because they were able to test people quickly. The key here is science only has a few things it can bring to bear. All these experimental medicines, they're fine to do if you're on the verge of death, and maybe they'll work, but maybe they won't. So the experimental medicines, forget those as, uh, as the future. The future has to be a vaccine, but that could take a year or two. The current situation is keep everybody away from everybody, assuming 100% contamination in this state, and then what you do is you start to get these tests out, which they're doing. We're finally getting rapid tests, not enough yet, but within, it seems, a week or two, we'll have every person in, in the tr this tri-state area where the epidemic's really bad, not upstate New York, but in this area, Long Island, New York City, Westchester, we'll be able to test everybody. And then if we can test people, the people that have had the germs and gotten over it, they can go back to work. Hey. If they, they probably have some level of immunity there for a while. That's what we're all looking forward to. Visiting with Dr. Dean Hart, a doctor and microbiologist, a former professor 
at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. We are the Y'all Show with John Rawl and our website, y'all.com, Y-A-L-L.com, is where you'll be able to find us. And if you log on there, you'll be able to see all kinds of coronavirus-related stories, interviews, such as this one right here. But we've done a lot. We've got a lot more coming as we're all over this subject, just like all media outlets are right now. It's an important thing. And Dr. Hart, I have to ask you, since we're a Southern-based show, over these last few days, we've seen temperatures in some of our southern states get up to around 90, a little bit north of that, a little bit south of that. And so that brings the question, do you, in your opinion, think that the warm weather that is going to be here permanently here in about a month or two, but for right now, these little little uh, teases, if you will, that have happened, is that a good thing to help get rid of this virus? Well, we want to hope it is. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. Okay. That's all you can do. There is certainly data to support that the flu disappears for half a year when it gets all hot. The, the, is it the heat, the humidity, or that we're outside more? We're not. They're all helpful for the flu bug. Now, when you get to this coronavirus, it makes sense scientifically that it's structurally compromised a little bit, but is it going to be compromised enough to stop its virulence and uh, make it less contagious or kill it for six months while we work on vaccines? That's a good question you got, a great question, and the science is there to support the concept. The proof is in the pudding, and uh, we don't... We, we know that it makes sense. It could be a great thing if it gets hot and humid, but it may not be. Yes. We don't know. Yes, sir. Well, I want to ask because this thing is so deadly because it affects the lungs. Is that also what happened with SARS and even the swine flu? Did it get into the people's lungs and cause death that way primarily? Yeah, and MERS was another one. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, what happens is it, it, people that have upper respiratory tract infections, they don't typically die. They may be sick as a dog for a little while, cough and have a fever. When it invades the lower respiratory tract, the lower, the inner lungs and way down there, then the opportunistic microorganisms go to town and these, this virus causes all sorts of funky metaphysical changes of your lungs, even if you get over it, if it's in your lower lungs, you probably ha will have some compromised breathing for months, years, a lifetime. But um, there's two parts, the upper and lower. If it gets into your lower respiratory tract, you're in deep trouble and they're going to probably try that experimental medicine on you. If it's on your upper respiratory tract, yeah, you're sick, you could be mildly sick, 80%. 80% it only goes to the upper respiratory tract, and some people don't even realize they're sick. Hmm. Well, Dr. Hart, forgive me. I'm not as smart as you. I didn't go and get all these medical degrees. So help me for those of us who aren't so up on our, our anatomy. The lower respiratory tract, what are we talking about here? Lungs, but what, what area are we talking about specifically? Oh, well, yeah. The lower respiratory tract is basically lower in the lungs. The upper respiratory tract includes your mouth. Oh, okay. Your, your, it goes from the air through you into the, but you can have upper, the upper part of the lungs are considered the upper respiratory tract to a limited extent. Then when you get into the bottom of the, of the meat of the lungs, the most of the lungs, that's the lower respiratory tract and that's the deadly version of this disease when it gets into the lower respiratory, into your lungs. It really, when it goes to town in your lungs, you're in trouble. Yes, sir. And if you don't mind me asking dumb questions here, but if I'm asking, probably a lot of people also have these same questions. A respirator is something that's in great demand right now, and you only put that on someone, I assume, when they're in really, really dire straits with this virus. What does a respirator, I guess it simulates breathing, but how do you know when to take somebody off a respirator? Well, you basically, when they don't have a problem breathing, you can test it, and there are different knobs and dials oh, okay. to ch 
change the pressure of these things to figure it out. Uh, you also take the temperature. If they have no more temperature and they seem happy and everything, you're more likely to take it out. If okay. they have a horrible fever and they're gasping for air, uh, then you need the respirator. It's, um, it's easy enough to figure out and experiment, not on the experiment like a laboratory, but you can lower the pump's pressures and then you'll get the, you'll see if it has any deleterious effect if people are able to breathe on their own more. Yes, sir. Well, that makes sense. I guess it's a little bit different from, let's say, somebody who's having to have something keep their heart going. This will be uh, a little bit different the way that it's set up. We're visiting with Dr. Dean Hart, an expert in microbiology and a published author on the transmission of viruses and diseases and, and of course lives in the new york area and we wish everybody there in the empire state the best and surrounding areas as they have been hit more than any other area with the coronavirus outbreak here in this country but of course no state is exempt from this thing and as you are a guy who studies these things dr hart does it surprise you the way this thing spreads so quickly throughout the entire world well, when you look at the nature of the contagiousness of this, it's it's very impressive compared to the flu. It, it, it it's a very delicate thing. This this coronavirus nineteen, it, it's um, the size maybe of a short wavelength of light. It's uh, the diameter is like let's say 100 nanometers. So it's very small. It's very delicate. When you put alcohol or wash with soap, it will disrupt the lipids and the proteins of, of the structure and it'll destroy it. So we can kill it. It's very, very small and delicate. The only problem is when you get vi viral particles, there's so many on the littlest piece that you've got to wash or use alcohol in the proper spots all the time. So there's so many of them, to beat them all is very difficult. Um, but uh, that it's so contagious, mm, it's what, three times more contagious than the flu, some people would speculate. But the nature of the deaths, the amount of de morbidity associated with this is a bit surprising compared to the flu, but not compared to SARS or MERS. That was a 10% death rate. This Gosh. thing's got a 1% to 4% death rate. Hmm. We had someone on our show earlier this week, and he mentioned, and he was a doctor, and he mentioned that taking vitamins A, B, C, D, and Z would go a long way in helping people try to not get the coronavirus or at least have horrible effects with it. What is your thoughts on vitamins and the immune system? Well, recently in a bioethics class, I mean, we were talking about the vitamins and how much people spend and is it of any value to us with the COVID or without. It's so debatable if vitamins really work. I wouldn't say if I took them, I'd go into an infected area, and I wouldn't say if I'm happy taking them, I would stop because they're worthless. We really, a proper diet is clearly the way to go, and you shouldn't need vitamins. But Everybody eats too many Twinkies and wants to, or they want to be so skinny that they see through. And the diet may not be perfect, and supplementing with vitamins is is okay, makes you happy, and it may benefit you. It should theoretically, scientifically benefit you, but the science doesn't show that the use of vitamins or the lack of use of vitamins with a proper diet is going to make much difference at all. Wrapping up our conversation with Dr. Dean Hart, Dr. Microbiologist, former professor at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons right there in New York City. And, Doctor, we want to ask also here as we, we wrap up our conversation with you today, the where do we go from here? What's next in this fight against coronavirus? I was listening to a White House press conference earlier in the week and Dr. Deborah Burks was talking about how this thing is likely going to have a sort of a three-year cycle, and that's why it's so important to flatten the curve as much as you can here in year one so that in year two and year three, it's not we're back visiting where we were the previous year. Well, there's a 
paucity of data to the public. We should be informed far greater than it seems that we are informed, or they just don't have the, the numbers. I mean, in a lot of states, there's one or two deaths. You can't really do statistical analysis and, and predict the three-year outcome on a couple dozen people that have the, these germs. You can do it with flu because millions and millions get the flu, so you can really be knowledgeable about it. Because this is so new, we don't have the data, and without the data, you really can't predict it. To me, the greatest positive thing you can take away. You want to stay healthy because there will be a vaccine, but when? It's not. Uh, to me, it seems like modern science will first, we'll get lots of tests so that we can stay healthy and stay away from sick people and sick people can stay away from us. And then on the second level, there will be a vaccine probably in the a year to two years by three years if there wasn't a vaccine i'd be very unimpressed with science hmm. and again some people point fingers here domestically for us not having the the best response to this thing but this is a global problem and i don't think any country has successfully fought off this thing and had zero at least a a modern country where people are coming in and out of that every country for goodness sakes even germany's chancellor has had to go into quarantine because of the coronavirus. Yes, this is nothing you could ever, in a science fiction movie, you could see something like this in the world with the zombies and the apocalypse. Yeah, but the thing is that if you were prepared like South Korea, it helps. But we're so technologically sophisticated in the United States. If any country is going to get these tests out and catch up, for being a slow starter. If we're going to catch up, this is the country that will catch up and surpass them all because once we get the tests out, which seems like within a month, everybody in New York State will know, or at least this area of New York State will know if they're positive or negative, if they've had it, they haven't had it. We're going to be on top of the game a lot quicker than the other countries, although some had a head start. E equal sophistication for South Korea and us in the sense to test it, but they were worried about SARS because their next door neighbors eat some funky food in, in China, and, and they were worried, so they didn't de-escalate de after SARS as we did. We used the, the money for Oh, God only knows what we use the money for. We won't go there. But <laughs> in a, for pandemic, future pandemic response, I don't think they were big on that in this country, but we're such a strong technological country. We're going to catch up and surpass these nations with uh, maybe we're a month or two. If we had spent infinite money preparing for a pandemic, could, be a, could we be a month or two or three ahead of the curve? Yes, but uh, who, you can spend infinite money on infinite things. There's limited resources, so uh, the government, uh, looking back, hindsight is 2020. I'm also an eye doctor. Trust me, hindsight's perfect, but who could have predicted such a thing? I got to give the government the pass in the sense, how would you ever predict something like this by spending huge money for pandemic response? But they had that for the swine flu 10 years ago. They were going to get all these respirators. They were going to get all these pandemic response uh, things set up. And, and then quickly thereafter, they forgot about it because mm. the swine flu didn't have this effect. I think I think that this country, with the Dow dropping two th or a third of a, th a third of a of its value in such a short time, that this country will remember. They don't remember the swine flu. People forget a lot of things, but losing all this money and sitting watching your kids not do their homework all day for a month straight, have they closed the schools there? Yes, they're closed pretty much everywhere in the South, are adjusted schedules for sure. Louisiana, actually per capita, is getting hurt about as bad as any state, even more than New York, because it's a much smaller population. And they've had a lot of deaths and a lot of people come down with the COVID-19. That's just one of our southern states, Florida, also getting hurt pretty bad. So it, it, we, we wish everybody the best, whether you're in New York, Washington State, or right here in Dixie, 
Dr. Dean Hart, your website is DeanHartScientist.com. We encourage everybody to go there and learn more about our guest that's been on today. And thank you for helping us learn a little bit more about the coronavirus, sir. Oh, you're very welcome. All right. And, and give us a good New Yorker attitude about how y'all are going to kick coronavirus's butt before we leave you. It's a puny little virus. <laughs> you wash your hands and you can kill it easy enough. <laughs> what he said, everybody, Dr. Dean Hart. More of the Y'all Show will be right back after this. Don't you go anywhere.